Welcome. Uh, I'm Lee Smith. I'm a librarian based out of the Mount Pleasant location of uh, Providence Community Library. And uh, I'm delighted that there's so much interest. As you mentioned, there's uh, approximately 200 people uh, that are interested in gardening with native plants. Um, so I, I geek out about plants and clearly many of you do too. Uh, so in spirit, I am at Davis Park Community Garden, one of the uh, dozens of spectacular community gardens and parks we have in Providence. Uh, so this year we're expanding our native pollinator garden. So I can't wait to take what I've learned from Karen tonight and apply it in, uh, in the spring. Um, I'll post a link in the chat if you'd like to get involved uh, at Davis Park or really any, any garden in Providence. Uh, this presentation is brought to you by the URI Master Gardener Public Presentation Program, which is a volunteer service of the URI Master Gardener Program, URI Cooperative Extension. Trained volunteers present workshops on a variety of topics related to environmentally sound horticulture. So if you have a group that would like to host a virtual presentation, just uh, follow the link that I'll uh, post in the chat later on. So uh, without further delay, I would like to introduce the star of the show. Karen Asher is a native plant specialist and former president of the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society. She holds a certificate in native plant studies with a focus on field botany from the Native Plant Trust where she volunteers in its plant conservation program. She is also a URI Master Gardener and has presented today's program at garden clubs, land trusts, and libraries across the state. So uh, take it away, Karen. Oh, thank you very much. That was a lovely awesome. intro. <laughs> um, I welcome all of you. I, it's unfortunate that I cannot see you, but nevertheless, I know that you are there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. When I first moved to Rhode Island about 40 something years ago, uh, there were more forests, more fields and more undeveloped land. Now we have more subdivisions, more shopping centers, roads, etc., and fewer natural habitats. Our backyards represent habitat opportunities for our native flora and fauna. I'm here because I want to help you learn how to create a biodiverse refuge using native plants and, and <laughs> a refuge for our plants and animals that share our planet. Environmentalism starts at home. Together, we can make sustainable choices which will have a cumulative effect. Okay. Why should you use native plants in your garden? Native plants are used to the local conditions. They have adapted to tolerate the amount of rainfall we get every year. They are used to the temperature changes we get with the seasons, from the cold winters to the hot summers. In short, they are indigenous to New England and they can survive here without any assistance from us. They do not need fertilizers, insecticides, fungicides, etc. They can be grown organically. Of course, they are perennial, which means they come back every year. So if you're lucky, they will get bigger and better every year too. The most important thing to me though, is that they support the pollinators that we very much need to protect. If you want more birds and you want more bees and butterflies in your yard, use native plants. The pollinators and the plants have grown up in the same neighborhood, so to speak. They know each other. They are old friends. A bee will always go to the native plant first because it recognizes it. It has seen it many times before and successfully fed on it. It will sample non-native plants while looking for food, but natives are the most reliable. In addition, Native plants restore soil health through erosion control and water filtration, and they foster a genuine connection with our region and enhance our sense of place. They make our environment richer, more biologically diverse, and of course, native plants are beautiful. In the upper right-hand corner is a high bush blueberries, always delicious in pies and cakes, Native plants have food value, and they also have medicinal value. The plant on the left is boneset. 
It was used by Native Americans as a tea. It is an herbal remedy for colds and fevers, as well as a pain reliever. The plant in the lower right is butterfly weed. White people used it as an expectorant and to treat smallpox. Native Americans gave it to new mothers to help produce milk. It, all of these plants have played <clears throat> a significant role in Native American culture. So what is a native plant? A native plant is any indigenous plant believed to be present in Rhode Island prior to the European invasion that began in the 15th century. I got this quote from Vascular Flora of Rhode Island, which is the book that you see on the right, which is published by the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. The book on the left is Flora Nova Anglii, which is an identification manual for all natives and naturalized plants in New England. These books are reference books. They're not coffee table books. They don't have a lot of pretty pictures, but they are the best books for checking to see if a particular plant is native to Rhode Island or New England. Obviously, I have them on my bookshelf. Rhode Island, whoops, sorry. Rhode Island has three ecoregions. The yellow area on the map is known as the Southern New England coastal plains and hills. The turquoise area in the middle is the Narragansett Bristol lowlands. And Block Island is the third ecoregion known as Cape Cod and the Islands. All of the plants that I will be talking about today grow in one of these regions, if not more than one. Of course, plants don't respect state lines. So many of these plants grow in other ecoregions and other states as well, especially our closest neighbors, Connecticut and Massachusetts. So what can you do to protect native plants? The first thing is never dig them up in the wild and purchase them from a reputable nursery. I'll be talking more about some of my favorite nurseries later on in the presentation. And it's also important to know that in Rhode Island, we have a, a law. It's actually called the Christmas Greens Act. And it states that it's illegal to take a part or the whole of any plant protected by this law, unless you are on your own property or have written permission from the owner of the property. Some of the plants covered by this law include white pine, cedar, hemlock, winterberry, laurel, dogwood, et cetera. Just think about that at the holiday time when you're making wreaths or swags or other decorative items. Okay, here are some techniques that you can use right now. The first one is right plant in the right place. Don't put a plant that likes shade in the sun and don't put a plant that likes sun in the shade. You will not be successful. Don't put a plant that likes wet feet in a dry location. It's all common sense stuff. In a minute, I'm gonna introduce you to some of my favorite plants. If you want, you can get a notepad and write down a few things or not, it's totally up to you. Many people clean up their yards in the fall. Whoops, I keep doing that, it's driving me nuts. Hang on, I'm sorry. Where am I? Here. Okay. I recommend that you wait until spring. Leave those seeds for the birds to eat. Leave those stems for the good bugs to overwinter in. Let things decompose and enrich your soil. When spring comes, I rake out the beds. I don't rake them down to the ground. I just am removing the top thick layer of leaves. Then I politely ask my husband to mow over the leaves and chop them up. And when they are well chopped, I put them back into the bed as mulch. Saves you money. You don't have to go out and buy fancy mulch. And what's great about it is as it decomposes, it enriches the bed. Don't leave it on the, let the leaves be on there too thickly, however because if they're heavy and large, it will make it difficult for new seedlings to emerge through them. 
when the, when the leaves are chopped, the plants have no problem. And my last piece of advice is never plant invasive species. You will only be creating problems for yourself in the future. I know from experience that they're really hard to get rid of and can persist for years. Okay, let's get started. I think that one of the most important things is to learn more about the plants that are native to our area. One way to learn about them is to join the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society. They have an excellent website with tons of good information, which I recommend you take the time to explore. They are also well known for their walks and talks. The walks are led by qualified naturalists in parks and preserves all over the state. It will give you the opportunity to explore some of Rhode Island's wildest places and see the plants growing in their preferred habitats. Sadly, due to COVID, these walks are temporarily on hold. We all look forward to the day when we can go out there again. When they resume, you will be notified if you sign up for their free newsletter, which you can easily do on their website. Okay, <clears throat> to prepare yourself, I suggest that you do a sun survey of your yard before you invest any money in plants. Just walk around your yard and note how many hours you, of sun you get in the front yard, in the side yard, in the backyard, etc. And then you'll have a better idea about which plants will thrive there. Do this when spring comes. In, in the lower right hand corner, of this slide, you will see a field guide that I recommend called Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. I always take it with me when I go for walks, just in case I find plants I am unfamiliar with and want to identify. Okay, so now the actual plants. Uh, obviously there are thousands of native plants in Rhode Island, way too many to ever talk about tonight. So I apologize in advance if I don't talk about some of your favorite ones. I have chosen the ones that I think are most garden worthy and the plants are organized by bloom time. So I'm gonna start with the earliest spring bloomers and then go through summer into early fall. One of the earliest spring bloomers is this beautiful plant called blunt lobed hepatica, anemone americana. Previously, believe it or not, there were two types of hepatica. One was round lobed hepatica, which liked forest uplands and rich soils. And the other was sharp lobe, which prefers bottomlands near streams. But they intermingled and crossbred or hybridized. And now there's only one kind of hepatica, blunt lobed. Folklore says a girl can win lovers, a lover's heart, by secretly putting powdered hepatica on his clothes. Mm. I've never actually tried that, so I don't guarantee that'll work. <laughs> uh, this plant is in the buttercup family. As you can see, it has beautiful violet blue flowers. And one of the most interesting things is that it is visited by uh, the blue azure butterfly. You can see that picture down in the bottom corner. Uh, it may look like a large butterfly, but actually it's tiny. It's less than an inch across in the wingspan, and it's pretty much the same color as the hepatica. Okay. This is trailing arbutus, Epigea repens. If in the Latin, E-P-I, epi, means upon. Repens means creeping. Gaia means earth. And that's exactly what this plant does. It creeps along the ground. It has an exquisite fragrance, but you have to get down on your hands and knees in order to smell it because it's only two to three inches tall. It, it has very pretty whitish pale pink flowers. And uh, <coughs> they were, these flowers were so attractive, they were widely harvested in the 19th century as a decoration. 
Concerned citizens in Massachusetts wanted to protect this plant as well as other native plants. And so they founded the Native Plant Trust, which is previously known as the New England Wildflower Society. This is bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis. It's in the poppy family and it blooms mid-April to early May. As you can see from the picture, it has beautiful white flowers with yellow stamens. And it, the blood root is interesting because it flowers before the foliage actually comes out. The foliage is very deeply lobed, but, and it's poisonous, so don't eat it. It got the name blood root because there is a reddish sap in in the roots uh, and Indians use that sap to uh, paint their faces and their horses and to dye their baskets. And it is co commonly pollinated by mining bees, which are pretty common around Rhode Island. Uh, the next plant is trout lily, Erythonium americanum. It is in the lily family and blooms late April to early May. There are two stories about how this plant got its name. The first is that it blooms at the beginning of trout season, which is around April 15th. The other story is that the leaves, which are, he are heavily mottled, if you look carefully, you can see what I mean. There are like brownish patches on the green. And some people think that the leaves resemble the body of a trout. You can believe whatever story you like. <laughs> this plant grows from a corm, which is similar to a bulb. If the corm sends up two leaves, the plant will flower that year. If it only sends up one leaf, it doesn't have enough strength or energy. It is not happy and will not flower. Also, this plant puts phosphorus, phosphorus excuse me, back into the soil. It is pollinated by queen bumblebees and bumblebee larvae feed on its pollen. The next plant is bird's foot violet, which is very different from the common violet that many of you are probably familiar with. The common violet is actually the state plant of Rhode Island. Uh, this plant got its name because its leaves look like a bird's footprint in the sand. I killed several of these the first time I tried to grow them. And that is because I was too nice. I put them in rich, loamy soil, but that's not what they like. They like barren conditions, sandy, infertile soils. Some people say that this plant has a heart of gold because you can see there's a yellow spot right in the center of the flower. But to me, one of the most fascinating things about this plant is that it has an eliosome. An eliosome is a fatty covering around the seed itself. You can clearly see it in the photo with the ant at the bottom of the slide. Now this slide has, this photo has been greatly enlarged so that you can see it clearly. The ants love this fatty substance and they bring it back to their colonies to feed themselves and others. This obviously moves the seed around and helps spread the plant. Don't try to see this on your own because it's not actually visible to the naked eye. Um, I've seen it, but only with a microscope. All right, this is a marsh marigold, Caltha palustris. It's in the buttercup family. And as you can clearly see, it has beautiful bright yellow flowers. The leaves are very shiny and a bit slippery if you step on them, which is how it got its common name, cowslip. It grows best at the water's edge or in very shallow water. I killed a few of these when I first started out because I planted them too far, too deeply into the water. 
and they were inundated and that did not make them happy. In the old days, this plant was known as friend of the farmer. When this plant is blooming, it signifies that the growing season uh, can begin in New England. Folklore has it that if you this, have this plant, it will protect your home against witches. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, this is one of my favorite plants. It's red trillium, trillium erectum. If you look at the word trillium, the first three letters are tri, T-R-I, which is Latin for three. It, this plant has three leaves, three petals, and three stamens. The petals are the round, uh, <laughs> round things that you're looking at, and the sepals are the pointy ones. Now the common name for this plant is stinking Benjamin because it smells like dead meat. But don't worry, you won't smell it. The scent is not strong enough for us to smell, but flies can smell it and they are one of its main pollinators. This plant is quite easy to transplant and it too has an eliosome. So it too is assisted in its spread by ants. The plant and the animal interactions in nature are truly amazing once you become aware of them. There are other kinds of trillium as well. We, there's a white trillium, otherwise known as snow trillium. And we also have nodding trillium here in Rhode Island, all of which are beautiful. Uh, this is Jack in the pulpit, Arisamia triphyllum. This plant has very large leaves. So when you are walking in the woods, it's easy to miss this flower because it is well hidden by the leaves. I took the photos uh, that you are looking at today. In order to take this one, I had to sit down on the ground and look straight at it rather than looking down at it from above. Sometimes the plant has is green and, and white, and sometimes it's purple and white. I obviously prefer the purple because it's very dramatic. The spathe is the pulpit. It's kind of like a hood that goes over the plant. It keeps the rain off the spadix, which is inside the hood. The jack is the flower bearing part. If rain gets in there, what happens is the flower rots and then it cannot reproduce. Uh, this plant has a rather amazing sex life. It starts off as a male and it stays a male for two to three years until it gets enough strength and food storage to take on the tougher job of being a female. If it is transplanted, it might revert to being a male. If there are not enough nutrients, it stays male. In the fall, it's much easier to find this plant in the woods because it has bright red berries, which you can see sort of in the middle of the picture. Okay. This one is Canada Mayflower, Mayanthemum canadense, which is in the lily family. It blooms from May until June and has very pretty little white flowers. This is essentially a ground cover. So it only grows two to three or maybe four inches tall. And it can form large patches, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner. It has round red berries that are very valuable to birds in the summer. Its inflorescence is a racine. That means it has a long unbranched stem with stalked flowers all around it. It's a great understory plant between other larger plants. Okay. This is wild columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. It's in the buttercup family and blooms from mid-May through June. Uh, as you can see, the flowers are red and yellow. There are many other species of columbine in Colorado, for example, where my daughter lives. There are white ones, blue ones, yellow ones, 
but here in Rhode Island, this is the only one we have, the red and yellow. It is pollinated by ruby-throated hummingbirds, which is the only hummingbird native to New England. In the fall, it forms papery follicles, which split open at the top and reveal really shiny black seeds. This plant likes sweeter soils, and we tend to have acidic soils here in Rhode Island. So the best thing to do is add some lime to your soil if you want to try to grow this columbine. This is wild geranium, geranium maculatum. Geranos is Greek for crane, and the common name for this plant is crane's bill. Uh, after it flowers, it forms a fruit pod, which slowly dries up on the stem. Eventually, the fruit pods pop and fling the seeds into the air in the same way that we used to uh, loop rubber bands around our fingers and then release it all at once. They can actually throw their seeds up to 30 feet away from the original plant, which is pretty amazing. But the most amazing fact about this plant is that the seed has a tail. It's called an awn, A-W-N, which allows it to move after it hits the ground. When it's wet, the awn is straight, kind of like that. And when it dries up, it slowly curls up and dry, wet and dry. And this kind of allows the seed to slowly creep along the ground. You might ask yourself, what in the world is going on here? Well, that seed is looking for a slight depression in the soil where a bit of extra moisture might accumulate, giving the seed a better chance to germinate. Uh, you cannot see this on uh, with your bare eye. Again, you will need a microscope. Uh, this plant is a colonizer and actually can be used as a ground cover. I have tons of it in my garden and I dig it up, parts of it, and give it away to friends all the time. The next plant is doll's eyes, Actea pacopodia, which is in the buttercup, fam buttercup family. It blooms from late May until early June and as you can see, it has white flowers. But the truth it is, it's not really grown for its flowers, although they're perfectly lovely. People grow them because of the berries. The common name for it is white bane berry. Bane is an English word, and it means slayer or murderer. The, yes, the berries are poisonous. Okay, but that's only to people. So if you have grandchildren who really uh, like to pick things off trees and pop them into their mouth, this might not be the plan for you. <coughs> On the other hand, the berries are eaten by songbirds, such as catbirds, robins, and thrushes. Obviously, their digestive system is very different from ours. So if you look closely, like at the picture in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that it has red stems. That's very unusual in nature. So if you're looking for a conversation piece, a conversation starter, excuse me, this plant is for you. The, the white berries have kind of a black dot on them, which looks a bit like those dolls from the old days that uh, opened and closed when you turn their heads back and forth quite a different and unusual plant. All right. This one is one of our native orchids. It's called Pink Ladies Slipper, Cypripedium acaule. It blooms late May, early June, and as you can see, has beautiful pink flowers. The leaves are basal leaves. That means their leaves are close to the ground, they do not grow up the stem. The habitat that it prefers is dappled shade, forest edges, not deep in the forest, because in deep in the forest, the canopy is too thick and there's not enough sun. 
So if you see this plant in the wild, don't try to transplant it. It requires a mycorrhizal fungi, which is kind of a white stringy fungi, and it needs that to survive. Chances are this fungi is not present in your yard. So if you dig it up, you will inevitably kill the plant. Another common name for this plant is moccasin flower because it kind of resembles a shoe. But you'll notice that it has a pouch. That pouch is an ingenious trap. It lures unsuspecting bees with that promise of nectar, but it acts like a lobster trap. It's a one-way route. You can't get out the way that you came in. So it has to crawl up the back of the flower and on its way out, it receives pollen on its back. This one is Northern Blue Flag Iris, Iris Versicolor. I love this plant. It blooms in late May, early June. You are most likely to find it uh, at the edges of ponds and streams and lakes. It tends to form huge clumps with really thick rhizomes. The Greek goddess Iris was a messenger between humans and the gods. They say a rainbow followed her wherever she went. Thus, Iris came to mean rainbow. It is a nectaring plant for the silver bordered fritter fritillary, which is, you can see uh, what that looks like in the upper left-hand corner. This is King Solomon seal, Hiligonatum biflorum. It's in the butcher's broom family. The flowers are a creamy white color. What? No, no, I'm going the wrong way. Hang on one second. The flowers are bell shaped, dangling down all along the stem. This stem does not grow straight up. Rather, it arches gracefully. After the flowers, it forms blue berries, which birds and small mammals love. The rhizome of this plant is edible, and it was used by Native Americans and colonists as a starchy vegetable. It was also used medicinally to heal wounds. In the South, this, the rhizome of this plant was used in voodoo to ward off evil. Now we have false Solomon seal, Mayanthemum racemosum. Botanists recently changed the name of this plant as false sounded like there was something wrong with it. So now it is called Solomon's plume. The young shoots of this plant look like asparagus. In fact, they are in the same family as asparagus and they are edible. The flower here, some people like it better than regular Solomon seal because the flower is at the end of the stalk. So it, as opposed to dangling down underneath it. And it also has edible berries in the fall. The berries start out that pale pink color that you see and eventually they turn blue as the temperature drops. Birds don't eat them until the temperature drops because that's when they taste best. They can tell by the color when they're ripe. This is partridge berry, Michella repens. This is a ground cover, very low growing. It's only one to two inches tall. It likes part sun to shade and acidic soils. It is basically a creeping vine that does not climb. It's a survival food for ground birds, such as partridge and quail, thus its common name, partridge berry. The red berries are sweet in the winter as the frost changes the starches in the berry to sugars. It, its other nickname is pig-nosed berry because it takes two flowers to make one berry. The ovaries of the twin flowers fuse this plant does not like heavy leaf cover, so you will find it occurring most naturally on slopes 
where the wind blows the leaves away. Very nice plant. Give it a try. This is wintergreen. Wintergreen is another ground cover. It's a very common understory plant in the forest. It's evergreen and it likes acidic soils. It forms broken carpets along the forest floors. Basically, it's following the gaps in the tree canopy above, looking for sun. The berries are edible and they have a minty taste. Indians use them as a cold remedy or to make a tasty tea. This is Turk's cap lily. Turk's cap lily blooms from July through August. And as you can see, the, it has beautiful bright orange to kind of a red orange color. The petals are reflexed. That means they, are, they sweep backwards and they form a shape that reminded someone of the hats worn by Turks back in the olden days, thus the name Turk's cap lily. This plant can grow quite tall, five to six feet, and can easily have 20 flowers or more on just one stem. So it lasts for a really long time because all the flowers do not bloom at once, they bloom in succession. If you look closely, you'll see that it has little brown spots or freckles on it and very showy, showy stamens that dangle down. It likes rich, damp soils. Native Americans use this bulb to thicken their soups. The next one is cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. Uh, it is in the Campanula family and blooms late July through early October. The flowers are a really bright red, almost crimson. Someday, some people say that this plant was named after the bird, the cardinal. Other people say, no, it was named after the Catholic cardinals who wore red robes. Feel free to believe whatever story you like better. The range of the ruby-throated hummingbird and the cardinal flower is almost identical, demonstrating the closeness of their relationship. In this plant, there's a toxic white uh, latex in the foliage, which means herbivores won't eat it. <laughs> that means if you have deer, it's not a problem for this plant. And it is also a nectaring source for swallowtail butterflies. Now we have Joe Pie Weed, Utricum purpureum. I love the color of this plant. It's very soft, kind of like an amethyst or a mauve, or some people say dusty rose color. Uh, it was used medicinally by Native Americans for coughs, colds, and fever. The flower heads consist of tiny tubular disc flowers typical of the aster family, which obviously this plant is in. The leaves are whirled. That means they grow all around the stem in a circle. The plant was named after a traveling herbalist or medicine man named Joe Pye. And it is visited by bumblebees, minor bees, and even leaf cutting bees. Beautiful plant, quite tall four to five feet tall, easily. Okay. This is New York ironweed, Vernonia novaboriensis. It is in the aster family and blooms mid-August till sep through September. The flowers are a beautiful, brilliant purple, the most beautiful uh, color. And, but this plant is quite tall so you must put it in the back of your garden bed, not the front. I cut it back every summer when it's about two feet tall and that way it doesn't get as tall and it gets bushier and I have more flowers and it, make, it makes the plant more compact essentially. Uh, it likes sun to part, to part sun and it is the larval host of the American lady butterfly. Uh, it does very well in coastal areas 
and it is called ironweed because of the toughness and strength of its stems and roots. Despite the, despite the fact that it is so tall, it, uh, the stems do not collapse or bend over in the wind. They just kind of gently sway back and forth. Uh, this plant was used as a blood tonic by Native Americans. This is one of my favorites. It's called bottle gentian, gentiana clausa. What you're looking at here is not a bud. This is what the flower looks like. It never opens. So you have to ask yourself, how does it get pollinated? Well, it's pollinated by bumblebees. The bumblebees manage to get inside. As you can see in the photo, the, they are the biggest bees and they are the only ones strong enough to open the flowers. They use their legs to gently pry open the flower and when the opening is big enough, they dive right in there, head first. It emerges a few minutes later, but first. It's incredible to witness. Now, bees are pretty busy, so they have no time to waste. So this is, uh, flower is communicating with the bees in a way. The bees can tell if the nectar has already been extracted because the opening at the tip turns purple. If it is still unpollinated, the tip of the plant is still white. Uh, if it's happy where it is, it can form large colonies. This is swamp rose mallow, hibiscus moschotos. It is the most tropical looking flower in Rhode Island. It's in the mallow family. And to me, it looks very, uh, it, it, uh, it's just very beautiful. The flowers, however, only last for one day, but they are produced in such abundance that there are always some in bloom. It will stay in bloom for several weeks. It is a bit slow to emerge in the spring and it dies back completely in the fall. Uh, I saw some recently next to the narrow river uh, in South Kingstown on the Narragansett line, right near the kayak rental shop, if you happen to know where that is. It prefers moist to wet soils, so it does not do well if we have a prolonged drought. The rose mallow bee is, pollinates this plant, and it pollinates, these bees do not pollinate any other plant. So this is, this bee is a specialist. Now we're coming into fall. This is the New England aster, Symphotrichum nova anglii, in the aster family, obviously, blooming early September through late October, beautiful purple flowers with yellow centers. The word aster means star. So it is a composite flower. The center disc of florets are usually, is usually yellow, and it is surrounded by rays that look like petals, but actually they're sterile florets. This plant can get a bit leggy. And if that happens, some of the lower leaves start to turn brown and it doesn't look that great. So the, what you need to do is to encourage more flowers by cutting it back in early June. This encourages the plant to be much bushier it's easy to transplant if you want, you can do, the best time to do that would be in spring. It, this plant is the larval host of the pearl crescent butterfly. And you can see uh, in the lower right hand corner what that butterfly looks like, very pretty. Uh, the next one is seaside goldenrod, Solidago sempervirens. This one is also in the aster family, but it blooms a bit later, early September through October. Uh, it has very thick, fleshy leaves. And this is the, has the largest flowers of all the native goldenrods. It is salt tolerant. That means if you live near the beach, this plant is for you. Uh, 
some people don't like goldenrods because they believe that goldenrods give you seasonal allergies. But this is totally untrue. The real culprit is ragweed. Ragweed blooms at approximately the same time as goldenrod and it's green. So it kind of disappears in the sea of green whereas this yellow plant sticks out. So people blame it. But actually goldenrod has very heavy uh, sticky pollen and therefore it has to be insect pollinated. Ragweed on the other hand is wind pollinated which is why this is the one that gives you the allergies. Okay, um, perhaps I've piqued your interest, I certainly hope so, in native plants and you would like to go see them when spring comes, of course. Some of the best local places to see native plant gardens is the Garden in the Woods, uh, which is owned by the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, Massachusetts, and uh, the Tower Hill Botanical Garden, which is in Boylston, Massachusetts. Other places that you can go see native plants in gardens are the Arnold Arboretum in Boston, uh, the Connecticut College Arboretum, which is in New London, Connecticut, not very far. And one of my favorite places is the New York Botanical Garden. Of course, that's a bit of a drive. <laughs> you need to be highly motivated. Uh, and a newer garden, which is absolutely fabulous, is the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, which is in Booth Bay, Maine. If you're ever up in the Maine area, I highly recommend that you go there. Don't miss it. Now, perhaps you would like to buy some native plants. Where should you go? Uh, I live in South County, so I have to admit that that's where I do most of my plant shopping. I highly recommend Blue Moon Perennials in Wakefield, The Farmer's Daughter, uh, also in South Kingstown. And if you ever take a trip up to the Garden in the Woods in Framingham, they have a fabulous selection of native plants. And they also run a farm called Nasami Farm, where they grow most of the plants. You can also mail order plants online. I've done it and it works pretty well. Sometimes they uh, come bare root, which means that they're not in pots, they're not in soil. They're just in plastic bags and you have to keep them uh, moistened and plant them as soon as possible when they arrive. Uh, some of the places I've ordered plants from online are the Eastern Plant Specialties, New Moon Nursery, Prairie Moon Nursery, North Creek Nursery, and Van Berkham's Nursery. And all the plants that I've gotten from them have been quite healthy. All right, and done very well. Of course, you might want to learn more about native plants. So I recommend these books. The first one is Growing and Propagating Wildflowers. The second one is Native Trees, Shrubs, and Vines. Both of these are by William Kalina. Uh, he was the horticulturist at the Garden in the Woods for many years. And now he's the director of the Coastal Maine Botanical Garden up in Maine that I mentioned earlier. They're excellent books. Uh, one of, another one that I couldn't fail to mention is called Bringing Nature Home. This is uh, a new version updated and expanded and it basically talks about how you can sustain wildlife with native plants. Uh, some other good books are The Green Garden by Ellen Sousa, Designing Gardens with Flora of the American East by Carolyn Summers and Native Alternatives to Invasive Plants which is put out by the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Okay. Some websites you might want to visit for more information because there's tons of information out there. Uh, you might start locally with the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society. Uh, you then try the Native Plant Trust's website and they have a wonderful site called Go Botany, which will is a, a place where you can learn to identify plants in the wild if you're going for a walk in the woods. 
Uh, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, while it's in Texas, doesn't just talk about plants from there. Uh, you, you put in your zip code and it will recommend plants for your region. Uh, the US uh, DA also has an excellent plant database. And right here in Rhode Island, the Master Gardeners have a wonderful resource called the Rhode Island Native Plant Guide. You can put parameters in there. For example, do you want plants that uh, like wet feet or do you want plants that like shade or sun or whatever the specific need is that you have, you can find advice on that website about what plants to put in there. Okay. All right, and now let's put it all together. Uh, this is a quote from Doug Talame, which says, we can no longer just view plants as ornamentals. We must consider their ecological role when selecting them for our gardens. The pictures that you're looking at are some photos from my garden. I hope that it will inspire you to try some pl native plants in your garden. So now I'm more than willing to, I've left some time at the end here so that you guys can ask questions and I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, you can type those questions uh, in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And um, I think that Lee will, will read them out loud and then we'll, I'll try to answer them. And I hope that you learned a few things and that you had fun. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Yeah, we have uh, lots of questions. Uh, I, we can start with um, John and Candace had uh, related questions about uh, converting their yard into a pollen, pollinator friendly spaces and, uh, you know, how one might do this without really requiring the same level of maintenance as, as grass. Uh, well, grass is. Uh, it grass obviously has to be mowed every, <laughs> on a regular basis. Glass, grass is a monoculture. It isn't doing anything to help the environment, the pollinators, the bee, the birds, the butterflies, nothing. So there's no question that if you plant native plants, uh, you, you're, you will be enhancing your environment and you will be helping the pollinators. So yeah, get rid of some of that grass <laughs> and put in some garden beds with natives. Yep. A few related questions about the distinction between Rhode Island native versus New England, uh, and just trying to, um, I suppose, right. figure out that distinction. Do you have any? Yeah, well, a lot of plants, um, how can I put this? They are native to Rhode Island, but at the same time, they're also native to other New England states. There are also some plants that are native to the entire East Coast. And there are some plants that are very widespread and they're native all the way to the Mississippi River. <laughs> so yeah, plants don't re respect state boundaries at all. And many of the plants that are not necessarily native to Rhode Island actually grow very well here. So it's the main thing, as I mentioned earlier, is to put the right plant in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacqueline was wondering if uh, the status of many of the plants that you had mentioned, uh, whether or not they were annuals versus perennials? No, none of them are annuals. They are all perennials. Now, in, and, you, and they are all readily available in nurseries. And they are also available at the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society's annual plant sale, which is uh, usually held in South Kingstown in, I believe it's June, although they did not have it this year on account of COVID. But when I first moved to Rhode Island, it was very, very difficult to find native plants in nurseries. They were, and, but over the years, they've become more and more popular, more and more in demand. And so obviously nurseries respond to consumer demand. And so now it's, it's much easier to find them. Everything that I mentioned here, you should be able, and, and more, you should be able to find at local nurseries. Okay. Natalie had an interesting question. She, she says, uh, uh, are there any native plants that you wouldn't recommend for say a very small garden because they might spread uh, easily or become a problem for one reason or another? Hmm. 
uh, native plants do spread, but they don't spread in an invasive, nasty kind of way. Oh, they spread slowly and gradually in, in a, I love that they spread because for me, that's like free plants. All right. <laughs> Who wants to, uh, and oftentimes I dig things up and share them with my friends. So if you have too many of something, give it away or donate it to the Rhode Island Wild Plant Society and let them sell it at their plant sale. Mary was concerned about deer. Uh, do you find mm -hmm. issues with native plants in the presence of deer? I mean, granted, they are wildlife. But... Yeah, <laughs> they are. Let's face it, I'm no fan of deer yeah, yeah. either, okay? Nobody wants to have their plants get eaten. That's okay, not yeah. fun. Um, I've actually changed and modified this talk because some of the plants that I had earlier, it turns out uh, deer really love them. So I try to I eliminate those from my presentation because there's no point in planting something that you're never gonna have the opportunity to see because the deer are gonna eat it before it has a chance to bloom. Deer really are a problem uh, in Rhode Island and they are one of the reasons that when you walk through the woods, you, you don't see as many native plants as you really should. Uh, some people don't notice that because they don't know what's missing. <laughs> they only see what's there, but I know what's missing and I find it very disturbing. Uh, Rock has a question about uh, your favorite plants that may be good companions for a veggie garden. Oh, that's interesting. I see your point because um, planting natives obviously attracts more pollinators and with any luck, they'll pollinate your veggies is at the same time that they're pollinating the flowers. But to be honest, my veggie, I do have a veggie garden, but it's completely separated from my other gardens, fenced off so that obviously the deer can't get in there and eat it, right? And, uh, Margie was wondering about a butterfly. Um, she was wondering what the butterfly was that likes fall aster or? That like, oh, well, was that the fritillary? I can't remember now. I'd have to go back and double check that. Let's see. Uh, should I check it now? That like the asters, hang on, okay. Yep, oh, that was the pearl crescent butterfly. Sorry, yep. <laughs> and perhaps, could we go back to, um, that slide that showed the, the range, the, uh, there was like the yellow, for example, those, Bonita was wondering how far the uh, yellow extended into sub southeastern Connecticut. It might've been one of your first slides. Oh, you mean the ecosystem? Yes. Right, right. Okay, hang on, I'll go there. Okay, thanks. There it is. Yeah. Okay, this is focused on Rhode Island. Thank so you. everything around it looks green. But in fact, yes, it's that yellow definitely does go into Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, a few questions about sunlight requirements. Okay. David, I'm wondering about um, your thoughts about plants for full sun uh, versus, say, you know, part and um, sun, mm -hmm. drought resistant plants. Yeah, it gets really, it gets complicated. Sure. Um, a lot of the, some of the plants that I showed you uh, like full sun in spring, okay? And they're, they're ephemeral. That means that they come out really early and before the leaves come out on the trees. So they are getting full sun in spring, but then of course the leaves come out and then they're more lightly shaded in summer, which they prefer. So uh, I guess things change. Uh, if you have trees, obviously you're gonna have more shade. I've had the experience of having things planted and then a tr the tree died and fell down and it changed the whole environment around it. Suddenly there was a lot more sun than there had been previously. And some of the plants responded joyously and some of them did not. And I had to move them to shadier areas. So for me, a garden is always a work in progress. You know, you, you have to be out there and respond to it. You have to see whether you're, if your plants are doing well and flourishing and if not, 
try to figure out why not and what you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of um, questions about your slides and uh, would we be able to make the slides available uh, maybe in like a follow-up email? Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks. Um, let's see. What about if you um, have limited space? Uh, say you um, have an apartment or, um, you know, is there any way to grow the, like um, native plants in say a container garden or, um, or do you have any, or I don't know, uh, perhaps there's some other, uh, really just any, any way to grow in, in really small um, areas? Hmm. That's a tough question. Honestly, I've never really tried to grow them in, in um in pots, but I imagine, I don't see any reason why you couldn't, but again, they would have, that would have to be outside, wouldn't it? So in, in order to get enough sun, right? And of course you'd have to water it often because pots dry out much more quickly than the ground dries out. Right, but I, I think it's an experiment. Try it, see sure. if it works. Okay. And what about, um, we had a handful of questions about like salty winds in that sort of environment, the coastal environment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations? You should definitely go onto, the, onto that website that I recommended. Hang on, let's see if I can get back there. Uh, where am I? Hang on. There it is. Okay. Since we're, I'm assuming that the majority of our listeners here are from Rhode Island, I would check out the Rhode Island Native Plant Guide, which is part, uh, you can find it at, at URI uh, under the Master Gardener Program. I'm just put in Rhode Island Native Plant Guide and it should come right up. There it will, as I mentioned earlier, you can specify what your particular needs are. So if you're looking for plants for a special area, it will be able to help you. Okay, thanks. And I might be able to ask two more questions and then we have so many, which is fantastic. Um, so what, I might, what I'll do is in a follow-up email, uh, I'll provide your, your email address and you can, you can ask Karen directly. Um, okay. So the first one is, uh, uh, John was wondering if there are any um, additional workshops that are available that are, um, that we can watch or um, or or attend uh, on on topics similar to this. Yes, the ELA or the Environmental Landscaping Association has excellent webinars. If you join it, and it's very inexpensive to join, I think it was like thirty five dollars or something like that for the year. You can access uh, an entire library of webinars. Mm -hmm. on uh, various topics, many to do with uh, using natives in your garden. And I've watched some of them myself and they're quite excellent. So I would uh, recommend the Environmental Landscaping Association's webinars. Thanks. And mm -hmm. also the, na the Native Plant Trust has great webinars on their website as well. And I, I believe they're free. Mm -hmm. okay. Lastly, we have a uh, question from MJ. Uh, they ask, uh, sometimes I like to grow from seed uh, to save money, uh, but find it, you know, it's um, hit or miss on whether I, you know, you can su success successfully grow uh, from seed. Um, do you have any suggestions for, for native plants to easily grow from oh, seed? Some plants are, <laughs> some plants are very particular. <laughs> By that, I mean, they, they have to over, they have to be outside. They have to have cold stratification. That means you can't just plant it and have them grow in one season. They have to overwinter in the cold before they'll come up the next year. Other, other plants uh, require, uh, when I had mentioned that some of the plants uh, are helped in their spread by ants. And while the ants are doing this, they're actually sort of chewing on the seeds. And so what they're doing is, is, is sort of roughing them up a little bit. 
when I've tried to grow those from seed, I have to take a nail file and, and, and actually scrape the seeds on the file to rough up the edges to try to uh, do what the ants do naturally. So native plants can definitely be grown by seed, but some of them are more easier and some of them are more difficult. You'd have to look up the specifics. In that book that I mentioned earlier, Growing and Propagating Wildflowers by William Kalina, there it is on the screen. That's the best book for very detailed information on how to grow all the different wildflowers and their special, what their special requirements are. Great. It's a great hobby. Do it. <laughs> so it's something new to learn, right? Always something <laughs> new to learn, that's for sure. Well, um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending. And uh, thank you, Karen, for sharing your knowledge with us. No, oh, it was great pleasure. Thank you yeah. for asking. <laughs>